introduce our presenter. Dallin Chambers received a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Utah in Exercise and Sports Science. From there, he continued his education at Century College in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, where he completed two more years of specialized schooling in the field of orthotics. He completed a one-year residency at Northwest Orthotics and Prosthetics in Provo, where he continues to work as a certified orthotist. And this training today will cover head reshaping through the use of a cranial remold remolding orthosis. The following aspects will be discussed. Head shape deformities, necessary measurements, how to obtain them and what they mean to you as the practitioner or parent, scanning process, overall treatment from initial evaluation to final appointment, insurance companies that cover them and their requirements. And now I will turn the time to Dallin, our presenter, and please feel free to ask questions through the chat function as we go along. Many of them already have spent a good deal of their lives in places. They're okay, committed to those thank places. Thank you. Now they can joining us today for this presentation on orthotic management of head deformities. What I have here is a PowerPoint presentation that we'll go through. Again, feel free to ask any questions you might have on this. There may be some information that you know, and there may be some information that you don't know that you want more um, information on. So don't hesitate to ask, that, ask those questions, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is just uh, begin the presentation. And let me just uh, go over the presentation outline with you. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about definitions, you know, different head shapes, um, words that I'm going to use that will clarify things for you as, uh, as you're watching. Head shape deformities, we're going to look at uh, evaluating. So from kind of the initial visit um, to the end, we're also going to look at different styles of helmets, uh, their function, how they work, different head shapes that they work on, and then we're, all, we're also going to talk about the scanning process. And I've got a scanner here with me that we will open up and, and use, kind of show you how it works so you get a better idea on the scanning, which is kind of a new technology other, other than, you know, casting the child. So we'll look at that, and then we're also going to talk about insurance companies. Insurances are getting better at covering helmets, but it kind of just depends on which insurance and which plan on that insurance that they have. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on um, some definitions here. We're going to again look at common head shape deformities here and start with definitions of terms. I'm going to use some, several terms, one of them being bossing, which is just an area of prominence. So it's kind of a high spot on the head, whether that's, you know, the forehead or on the parietal bones, any type of prominent area. We're going to go over occipital plagiocephaly, which is more on the diagonal part of the head, and uh, kind of on the occipital region. We're also going to talk a, a little bit about uh, frontal plagiocephaly, which goes in hand in hand with the occipital plag plagiocephaly. We're going to talk about uh, facial asymmetry, which is the difference in the bony and soft tissue structures of the head. And, uh, right compared to the left as well as the face, okay? And then we're going to talk about ear shear um, throughout the process, also called ear shift, which is just uh, the difference in, in one ear versus the other. And that typically occurs with the plagiocephaly uh, deformity of the head. Just a couple of quick pictures here of the head shape deformities. First one being plagiocephaly, which again is just a flatness on that posterior aspect, um, usually on one left or right occipital areas. And sometimes we'll also see a little bit of flatness on the forehead, um, on the contralateral side of the flatness in the back, so on that front forehead there. And we're also going to look at brachycephaly, which is flatness on the back, uh, central flatness in the back of the head, as you can see there by that picture there in the middle. And then we're also going to look at scaphocephaly, which is less common than the other two, which is just a long, narrow head shape, front to back in, in comparison to our, our width measurement. First one we're going to discuss is just uh, def deformational plagiocephaly, sorry, brachycephaly, which is, again, that flatness. You can kind of look at this child's head in the picture here, and we've got that flatness across the back side of the head there. 
And typically the brachycephaly is characterized by prominent parietal areas on the left and right, or bossing on the parietal regions of the head, with central flatness in the back. Not typically um, associated with any ear shear or frontal bossing. A lot of times you'll see kind of a forehead that kind of juts out a little bit as well, as well as a high cranial vault area. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, typically all these head-shaped deformities are, are caused by a, some type of external force, okay? Whether that's, you know, car seat or laying in a crib, um, you know, any type of object like that that's going to cause that. Sometimes it's caused by just holding them in the arms. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but kind of the characteristics of, you know, the brachycephaly head-shaped deformity. Central occipital flattening, again, when I'm talking about that is, is really just this area right in the back of the head, this being the front. So flatness right on the central area of the head, okay? Um, they typically have an abnormally wide head, so right above the ears will typically have some bossing of the head in the parietal regions there. And then also the head typically, I don't have a good example here, is going to slant forward a little bit and come up high in the back and then just kind of drop off there. And so that is typical of a brachycephaly child. And then we have also asymmetrical brachycephaly which has some of the same characteristics where it's flat on the back of the head, but it also kind of tends to end up a little flatter on a left or back diagonal. As you can see with the picture here, we have that central flattening, and then we also have that difference here on that back left side of the child with some bossing on the right side here. So it's a multiple, kind of a, a dual head shape deformity there with asymmetrical brachycephaly, a combination of brachycephaly as well as plagiocephaly. So, and just kind of some terms there. Again, asymmetrical molding of the head caused by external forces. Car seats, um, swings, bouncers sometimes, and or laying in the crib. So, then let's talk a little bit about uh, deformational plagiocephaly which is the diagonal difference from one side to the other, okay? So what we're looking at is some characteristics with this head shape, as you're, you're kind of looking at that picture there, you can see that back right side on that child is flat, and then that front left side as well also has some flattening with some facial asymmetry. Notice on this child on the right, that picture on the right, on that child has the same characteristics where the front left side is slanted and then the back right side has that flattening as well. But you'll also notice, which you can't see the left ear, but the right ear is shifted forward from that left and so we have some differences between the ears as well. So let's talk about some characteristics of deformational plagiocephaly with this. Um, again, Characterized by uh, flatness on, on the back one side there, as you can see there. And um, we also have an asymmetrical molding of the head, again caused by external forces. So the same characteristics are going to apply here. Often associated with torticollis, which is a, a tight left or right um, sternocleidomastoid muscle, which tends to make them lean one way or the other as they're, you know, growing up through the early stages of life. So. We're also looking at ear shift on the flat side. And again, you can't see both ears on this picture here, but what we're looking at is that left ear is a little posterior and the right ear has shifted forward. So we have a little ear shear or ear shift on this picture here as you're looking at that, uh, that right side. Also what you're gonna see is the forehead bossing on the side that has the flatness. And so as it pushes it forward, those, the bony structures um, kind of push forward as that external force is there, which causes the bossing on the forehead and then the ear shifting forward. Okay? Again, if there's any questions, go ahead and, and make sure you indicate those to us so that we can answer those for you. Then we have the head shape of scaphocephaly. Scaphocephaly is a long, narrow head 
also uh, kind of indicated as kind of the football shaped head. So narrow on the sides and then very extended on our front to back or anterior posterior measurement. Long narrow head shape prevalent in infants with sagittal synostosis and NICU babies due to sideline position. So a lot of times, you know, once they get in the NICU, if they're early when they uh, are born, a lot of times, you know, the position that they can keep them in that will allow them to breathe and function is the position they keep in for an extended period of time, which causes this flattening either on, you know, diagonal measurement or on our side to side, um, and which gives us a long, narrow head shape. And, and you can't fault them for maintaining the child uh, in a position that allows them to function. So we kind of go in and, and after, kind of give us a little bit of correction there on the head shape. We also get, um, with this head shape, is a very prominent occipital area. I'm pulling up the head here. This is not a, a scaphocephalic head here. But what you would see is this would come off and have a very prominent region here on the occipital area. You'd also find that the forehead sometimes will jut out as well. So we have a very long, narrow head with respect to the width of the head. Okay, and that is the characteristics kind of of a scaphocephalic head. And again, typically caused by some side laying um, in the infancy of the child and also caused by uh, some type of synostosis that um, allows head to grow in, in one area and not allow it to grow in other areas. So let's take a look at um, why these skull-shaped deformities don't resolve as easily as they used to. And uh, kind of talk a little bit here. We've got the logo for the Back to Sleep program, which is one of the big, I guess, kind of the big things that came out that has caused a, an increase in head shape deformities. And, and what that is, is in 1992, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and indicated that supine sleeping, um, you know, having the child lay on their back is going to be the best position. And the reason for this is that it decreases the amount of SIDS, which um, at the time was a big issue. It still continues to happen, but not as prevalent because of this um, laying on the child's back for sleeping. Um, the problem, or the one thing that we did see with that is, as they're laying flat on their back, that external force on the head is there. And what happens is that force of the bed, um, or, you know, like, carrier, the, the car seat, because they're laying on their back, that increased that external force on the head, causing flatness to occur. And that might be just, you know, on the diagonal and or on the, the posterior occipital area of the head. So, um, and that was in 1992. And the one thing that they did find, again, is that the number of um, SIDS cases dramatically reduced, but the number of children with head shape deformities increased because of that. And again, that's just that external force on the baby's head. Um, again, if, if we look at uh, some of the reasons, we had ex extended time in the supine position when awake. Um, carriers, car seats, swings, etc. you know, anything that's going to have that force on the back of the head. Next thing is, um, sometimes we have some neck tightness due to, again, that torticollis or the tightness of the neck muscles, which, if not resolved, keeps them laying on one side of the head, whether, you know, left or right, and they just can't, they don't have that full range of motion to go both to the left and to the right. And when they're laying down, this keeps them in that one position, keeping that external force in that one position and not rotated to the other side. Um, the other, some other things that might happen is we have increased um, multiple birth, births occurring. What happens is we get as we get more children inside during the gestation period is that we get less and less room for each child. And so sometimes twins or triplets uh, may come out with some flatness just because they're in a position where they don't move a lot during the, the nine or 10 months of gestation. Uh, we also have more preterm babies that are surviving. Again, in the NICU, which then, you know, they, they're placed in a position which, again, allows them to function and, and live but it also creates a spot where they're kind of in a position where the external force will act on the head. So, um, And they're a little bit more fragile when they come out and they haven't gone through the, through the full period of gestation. So, 
orthotic components in the treatment of head shape deformity. So if you have any questions on those head shape deformities, let me know. If not, we're just going to kind of continue moving on. Some treatment components, um, non-synostotic deformational, deformational plagiocephaly. Again, non-synostotic synostotic, um, is that there's nothing fused yet. Okay? And, and we'll talk a little bit about the cranial synostosis a little bit later on, which is just a, a fusion or, or something that's already happened that we can't account for other than surgery. So what we're looking at is diagnosed with clin clinical observation, and we're also going to be looking at um, you know, if the doctor feels x-ray, CT, or some type of MRI may be used to also rule out the cranial synostosis. And we're also looking at uh, uniform growth, the head shape. If we're noticing that, you know, there's some indications of, of the synostosis occurring, we can look at that and kind of just see with synostosis, a lot of times the ears won't move. And so the ears will be in line with each other, but the head in the back is really flat on a diagonal measurement. And a lot of times that's a good indication that, that something is fused, which then allows us to, to send it to a cranial facial doctor, and they have a chance to look at it. And, and then, you know, get back with us as far as whether or not a helmet is indicated or surgery to kind of correct that synostosis or that, that fusion. We're looking at maximum growth um, when that occurs is the treatment um, is, is typically when the child is growing the fastest and that is usually between four and seven months of age. It varies a little bit depending on you know when the child was born. If they were two months early, adjusted age is going to be different than if they came out right on time. So it can be treated <coughs> excuse me, up to about 18 months of age although the growth that we see from about 12 months up to about 18 months is really decreased from that you know, four to a year time frame. So it really decreases quite a bit. And then after 18 months, the child's head is pretty well fused together, although not, it's going to continue to grow to the head shape or the, the size of an adult head. It's not quite done growing at that 18 months, but the growth that we can correct or use in the correction of the head has happened at that point and so we're not going to see any growth occur from there and change with the helmet. The other thing we're looking at is the compliance. The compliance really is a big factor in how much correction we get with an orthotic device on these children. The helmet is worn 23 hours a day and that allows us to catch all that growth and, and maximize the growth period throughout the day and usually about a three, three to four month average time frame. We're going to talk a little bit more on how each helmet works, um, but the three to four month average really just depends on how fast the child grows. What we're looking at is if we, we kind of have this helmet here to show you, uh, this is an example of uh, one of the helmets that we're going to talk about. And as far as how they function, you know, whether, whether it's a padded one or the clear, thinner one, they function the same way. And what we're looking at is creating a pocket or a void in the helmet. Once you can see that is we've got this gap here. And what we're doing is we're taking the growth and we're redirecting it to that spot where there's no resistance in growing. We're going to contact our high spots. You know, if we have the flatness over here, we're going to contact our high spots here and here and kind of prevent the growth from occurring there and redirecting it to where we don't have anything stopping it. And that allows this area to catch up. And then the helmet comes off. The interesting, the interesting thing to note about that is the helmet works off the child's growth itself. And so if the child doesn't grow very fast, that growth or that change in the back of the head doesn't occur as fast as someone who grows a, a lot. Because the helmet is just redirecting that growth of the child to the flatter area. So 23 hours a day and three to four months is kind of an average. Sometimes they'll go five to six or even longer, and sometimes they'll go two to three. So, and one of the things is that we'll never, typically, unless they're really bad, the helmet doesn't get started until about four months of age. And that is usually due to the neck just not having the strength to be able to support the, the weight of the helmet. And continuing on here, the goal of the orthotic treatment is to provide effective and progressive realignment of the skull. So we're just trying to kind of get a little bit of correction there with the skull. The importance of that is we'll talk a little later about you know what might occur if we let that 
deformed area or that, that um, external force to continue to happen without the correction, kind of some of the things that will occur with the child as that happens. So, why treatment? Uh, this is one of kind of the big questions parents will come in, well, yeah, but what do we do? Uh, or what's going to happen if we don't do anything about it? So let's talk a little bit about that. Things that might occur if, if the helmet is not used, or say the, the torticollis, if that isn't corrected, things that might occur. Fa failure to treat can lead to deformations of the cranial s structures. And that's, you know, the bones as they shift forward, they're going to mess with some stuff from that, that uh, external force. Increased risk of ear infections is kind of, is one of the, the new things that's kind of out in the studies. And what we're looking at is, is because we have that flatness on that back occipital parietal area, the bones have shift, shifted forward and that takes things with it. And so one of the things is the ear. So we get some ear shear and that changes that canal and changes the auditory structures of the, of the ear. So we do sometimes see a little risk of ear infections, a little higher risk of ear infections. The other things we'll see is some TMJ uh, disorder, jaw misalignments or malalignments, orbital asymmetries, vision and balance concerns. As the child gets worse, and sometimes we'll see some up to about two centimeters difference between the, the left and the right back sides. And so as they get pretty significant or severe in their head shape deformity, we see a lot of of facial asymmetry. So we'll see one eye droop down or we'll see a cheek come out, we'll see the ear shift forward as well as the forehead. And then we also we have some concerns with the structural integrity of the head there and things that are occurring. We also have social stigma. And that is uh, actually one of the big things for parents is, you know, is my child going to be made fun of? And when they get older, are they going to be able to wear a football helmet or a hat? Are they going to be able to do some of those things as they grow up? And that is one of the, one, a big concern, I guess, for parents. And so one of those things that we address with them when they come in. And, and really, that depends as far as the correction they get. So we also have forehead deformation, again, with the forehead bossing, one forehead back, one, one part of the forehead forward. Moving on a little bit, we have auditory um, processing defects, again, with that uh, ear infection and the ear shifting forward. Sometimes we'll have some issues with that. Possible headaches. We also have studies that suggest that infants may require more services in school because of, you know, they may have some hearing, is hearing issues, um, TMJ, so maybe some speaking stuff, but minor, minor things, unless that, that range or that difference is in the severe category or significant. So we want to watch that. And then torticollis, if left untreated, is not going to allow the patient um, a symmetrical neck extension. They'll always be kind of tilted to one side or the other, which will then decrease their range of motion. And then we'll have symmetrical neck extension that won't occur. It'll be more of an asymmetrical tilt um, with moderate extension on the one side. So we want to kind of take care of some of these things so that we don't get these issues um, that occur later on. So moving on here, let's look at uh, patient evaluation. So when you're looking, you know, as a therapist or, you know, as a parent who might have a child that has a little bit of flatness, let's go over kind of the, some of the things that you can look for and then some of the things that we're going to look for as far as um, treating a patient that comes into our office, looking at the head shape and kind of getting an idea of how bad it is and whether or not a helmet is actually needed at this point. First thing we're going to do is obtain a history. Uh, look at uh, multiple births. Was the, was the child premature? You know, did they spend a lot of time in the NICU? Did, uh, did that cause it? Or they just spent a lot of time in, in a car seat or you know, a stroller or just in a, a supine position laying on the floor? We're also going to look at delivery complications, suction, forceps, you know, anything like that that might have caused some sort of flatness as it came out, as the child comes out. We want to know kind of what's caused this flatness. Torticollis, we want to know if there's some torticollis and if it's being corrected. If it's not being corrected, we want to then kind of talk with them about seeing a pediatric therapist that might help them 
do some of the correction of that torticollis. What we find is a lot of times with the torticollis, you know, as that gets corrected and they're able to move their head both ways, we'll see some correction of that head shape deformity even without a helmet. So we want to make sure that that gets addressed quickly so that one, head shape deformity can be prevented and or they can get some correction. If the torticollis is happening when they come to our office and the head shape hasn't changed, we want to make sure that then we, we begin with the helmet because that's kind of the next step after positioning therapy and if that has or has not occurred. Extended time in the birth canal. Sometimes that will cause um, some flatness and so we want to know that. And then position of the child in, the, in utero. Whether they, you know, were down, were, were up, you know, different things that might have caused that. And so sometimes that flatness will, will be from birth. So the child will come out flat. We want to know that. Other things we want to know is lateral tilting, suggesting torticollis. Again, it, is that being treated is the big thing. Incre increased uh, cranial vault. And again, we're moving on to kind of visually assessing the child at this point. After we've taken that history of the child, we want to look at the head shape. And we want to look at it from different angles. And so increased vault, uh, height, brachycephaly, um, ear shift where the ears go and look down at the head and just see where those ears are. A lot of times with that uh, plagiocephaly we'll see one ear shifted forward. Sometimes it's significant and sometimes it's, it's barely noticeable and a lot of times the parents haven't noticed it, noticed it at all and so we educate and kind of look at them and say you know take a look at it from the top of the head and just see where that ear is. And if that's forward, you know, it's something that obviously we want to take note and put in our documentation and just to, to follow it. And then unusual side to side or anterior posterior forehead slope. Um, and that might suggest a flatness on the one side of the head. And then is the anterior fontanelle still open? So we want to just kind of assess how much growth is still left. Visual assessment kind of continued. Let's look at some other things here that, that we're looking at. We're going to note any areas of bossing. So whether that's the forehead or the parietal areas, you know, right above our ears. Sometimes it'll be, you know, the forehead will boss up a little bit and then behind the contralateral ear, sometimes that will boss out quite a bit on the back um, parietal area into the occipital region. So we're going to note that. We're going to you know, get a picture from above to see where things are at. No areas of flatness again. Uh, ear alignment, uh, facial asymmetry. We'll look at the eyes, look at the nose, the mouth, and the cheeks. And so, uh, oftentimes I've seen some kids that on their cheeks they'll have one side that is much bigger than the other side. As you look straight down on the child and you look right at the nose, you'll have a flat area. You'll also typically have kind of a cheek as things are shifted forward. And this is typically on the more drastic, more severe cases. You'll see the, the cheeks come forward a little bit. Um, the eyes, one eye will droop. Sometimes you'll see some, uh, you know, the eyebrow will kind of droop down with the eye. And so we want to note all those things that are occurring on each child that comes in. And this is kind of the process we go through with each child as they um, come in for an evaluation. And what we'll do is kind of evaluate and, and see if the child needs the helmet. And this evaluation um, is done free, so they can come in and just kind of get a, an idea of whether or not it's needed. Evaluate the baby from every side, uh, sideways. We're going to look at them front to back, sideways. And we also want to look at them straight down from the top of the head. Oftentimes we'll take pictures as well that will allow us to document in our um, charting where that flatness is. We don't want to just look at the child from one side because then we're leaving the other side out and we want to get a good picture of what's going on. So after our evaluation has happened and we've kind of got that patient history from the parents as far as you know what type of birth it was, how early the child was, was their time spent in the NICU, after we've done that as well as our visual things, we're going to go on and we're going to take some measurements when they come in. And the measurements is what's kind of given us that idea of how bad it is and whether that helmet 
or the orthosis is needed on that child. On every child that comes in, we're going to do our measurements. The measurements we're going to look at, we're going to look at head circumference. It gives us kind of a baseline of where that child is. We're going to do our side to side measurements, and that's just ear to ear. So we're just looking at this measurement here, okay, which will just give us this width measurement. Next one we're going to do is just get us our front to back measurement, which allows us to compare our width to our length when it comes to brachycephaly. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as well, okay? So the other one we're going to do is just our, our diagonal measurements. So kind of the front, front right to back left, and then we're going to switch it. We're going to take our measurements from our, from our front left to our right back, okay? And that will give us our diagonal difference. So let's talk about each one of those. Uh, circumference, again, gives us a baseline of where each child is at. Allows us to kind of track their growth overall. And a lot of times, um, the insurance companies will have their requirements that doesn't allow us to start the helmet right at that point. And, and so we're going to take a circumference measurement to get an idea of where that growth is as we're tracking them before the helmet's on and then when the helmet is on, each appointment they come in, um, we're going to take some measurements to kind of just see kind of overall growth, what's going on with the child's head, okay? It's just above the eyebrows and it's just around the back, okay? So kind of right in this area, we're going to get our circumference measurement around the widest part of the head. Again, establishes a baseline for us. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our width measurement, which is just our side to side, and typically our widest area. A lot of times that isn't directly above the ears. Sometimes it's right above one ear and then shifted back a little bit over the other ear depending on the head shape. And so we may kind of give it a little bit of a tilt there to try to catch that widest area. But typically, especially on the brachycephaly kids, that area is going to be right above the ears usually, okay? As that flatness on the back has occurred right above the ears. So we're going to get that measurement. A lot of times it's called urion um, to urion, which is just our widest spots, our EU to EU. If you look at the little picture here, you can kind of see above, you know, above this person's, this little image, the ear, we see EU and EU on the sides there. That's what we're looking at, urion to urion when we're measuring that measurement. Okay? And then we're also going to take our length measurement, measurement, which is our glabella to our opisthocranian. We'll just go OP on that one. And so we're going to take it right from the, basically the center of the eyes and then to our widest or our longest occipital area, okay? And we're going to take that measurement. So just from this G here to the OP in the back, and that's going to give us that measurement there. We're going to talk about why it's so important to get those areas correct later on in discussing the head shape and what the measurements mean. So the next thing we're going to take is just our diagonal measurements. And those diagonal, diagonal measurements are done from one side to the opposite back side of the head. And you can kind of see in, in the picture there, we have the calipers on that allows us to measure the back of one side and then the front of the other side, the contralateral side. The measurements are typically taken from about 30 degrees from midline. So you want to establish where that midline is, right above the nose, right in the glabella area there. And then we're going to go about 30 degrees off of that. And, and that's more of kind of an eye. We're eye in that 30 degrees. And then we're going to come back to the back here, on the back of the head, which you can see here with the calipers in this picture here that we have. Measured from left to right, and then from right to left. And that's going to give us our diagonal difference. And typically, we're, um, and we're going to do this on every head shape that comes in, not just on, say, the plagiocephaly, which is the head shape that's more flat on the diagonal difference, or the diagonal area. But we're going to take it on every patient that comes in that allows us to establish our baseline. Okay? Now, moving on, measurement norms. So when we're taking these measurements, we're looking at where they stand in relation to the norms that are established, okay? So our diagonal difference, after we've taken, you know, the, the left to right and right to left measurement, 
we're going to subtract and we're going to get a difference there. And what we're looking at is anything outside and, and really 0 to 0 0.3 is the norm but what I have in here is just the insurance company norm. So anything above that 0.6 is considered outside the norm or to have enough flattening that a helmet would be covered or warranted. Okay, And anything between that 0 and 0.6 is going to be considered inside the norm even though as we get higher to that 0.6 there's going to be some noticeable flatness on the back of the head. Then we're also looking at the cephalic ratio which is used in determining the brachycephaly as well as the scaphocephaly head shape deformity. And then what I've done here is just giving you an idea of determining that cephalic ratio. So it's going to give us a percentage and if that percentage is outside the norm that's when we look at a helmet. So what we're going to do is down here you can see a, a calculation here which is just the cephalic ratio calculation and what we're going to do is we're going to take the head width and then we're going to divide it by the head length which is just the G to OP measurement and then we're going to times it by a hundred so it's going to come out like a 0.95 or 0.96 and then we times it by a hundred gives us a percentage of 95 or 96 percent and if we look down at this chart that we have here this is these are the measurements that are considered the norm okay so anything outside two standard deviations above the norm is considered flat or significantly flat enough that a helmet would be needed and anything then within that is going to be considered norm again as the higher you get the flatness gets more severe so it's more noticeable on each child as it gets higher so anything um, for a male of 6 to 12 months anything above a 91.2 percent is considered to be outside the norm a lot of times I've seen I guess the most drastic drastic I've seen is 108 percent which means they're significantly wider on our side to side and flat significantly flat on the back of the head a lot of times we'll see them from about 95 to 100 percent and you know at 100 percent we're equal on our front to back and our side to side measurements a lot of them will come in with either one with just one head shape deformity but sometimes they'll come in with with both brachycephaly and, and plagiocephaly in which case we kind of have to look at both sides and, and measure all of it and determine what that patient's coming in with so um, as we look female anything under the 60 63.9 and 69.5 is going to be considered a scaphocephalic head shape and then on a male 63.7 and 64.8 so anything under there is going to indicate a very narrow and a very long head anything above it this 83.7 and these numbers on the right hand side anything above those numbers is going to indicate a very wide head with a very short front to back measurement and that's what we're looking at as far as our measurements so as we go through that measurement process and we get to our final numbers that determines with um, positioning and some other things determines whether or not the child qualifies or, or meets the need for a helmet principles of orthotic intervention again we talked about these a little bit already but we're looking at a critical window of opportunity and specifically that's kind of between the ages you know four months to about 12 months and then it really drops off after about that 12 month period we drop off quite a bit and the growth occurs very slowly and it's not as much and the, the, the best time even between you know even though we can go up to about 12 months and get some good growth between four and seven months of age is going to be the greatest growth potential that's our fastest growth period then after that it slows down as they get older until about a year and then it drastically drops off but between four and seven months so knowing that it's critical that the child you know if, if you're a therapist and you're seeing that child and they come in at two months of age and have flatness it's critical to get them working on positioning therapy so that if it doesn't correct we can then get a helmet on during this high active or growth phase of the child between four and seven months of age so as they grow we can get that but let's let's get that and see if they need the helmet and let's do the position 
positioning therapy early on. Hey, yes. Dylan, we have a question. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Debbie was wondering, she's an, an occupational therapist, will the cephalic ratio alone qualify the brachiocephalic kids since the ODA would be WNL? Um, not familiar with all the, the letters there, but as far as uh, like insurance, is com insurance companies, if we go back up to that chart, if they fall outside the two standard deviations with that scaphocephalic, um, insurances will cover it as long as that insurance plan does cover. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but as long as it's below, then yes. She said ODA is your diagonal, WNL, normal limits. Okay. So, yeah, if it's outside those normal limits, then, then yes on that as far as insurance and, and needing a helmet. So if that scaffold cephalic number is below 63.9 or 69.5 for female and 63.7 and 64.8 for males, then yes. And I hope that answers your question. If not, get back with me, okay? And the other thing I wanted to go over here on this principles of orthotic intervention is, um, again, we, we talked about the helmet and how they function as far as providing that area where the growth can occur. So we're going to provide total contact in areas where growth is to be prevented or discouraged and we're going to redirect that growth to our flat area where there's nothing there to, to contain the head. And we're going to allow space uh, where growth is desired. The symmetrical helmet creates a pathway for that growth to occur. Okay? Um, and then we have a couple different styles of helmets here. As far as the function, they both function the same way. Okay? So it kind of gives you an idea what helmets look like. Now, what I wanted to go over with you and provide are some examples or some pictures, some diagrams of how they function for each head shape, both the scapho, brachy, and then the plagiocephaly head shape deformities, okay? So let's look at uh, first the plagiocephaly patient. And what we're looking at is first a, a cast or a scan would be obtained of the child. And then that cast or scan gets modified to create that gapping in the back of the head where that flatness is occurring. And you can see that here um, with the green arrow and then this black arrow that comes in. And we've got that dotted line on there. That's indicated where we want that growth to occur. And so that's that area where that buildup would occur, allowing that gap in the helmet to be there. So as the child is placed in the helmet, um, what you would see is that big open area behind the head. And it's normal to see a big open area on these kids that you know have come in with 1.3 centimeters difference or 1.5, you're going to see quite a significant gap in the back. And we're going to contact those high spots, which is indicated by our red lines here. We're going to contact the bossed areas of the head and then uh, prevent that growth from occurring in those areas. And then contact will be maintained in the areas that we don't want the growth to occur. You can also notice in this picture here, we have some ear shear on that right side. And then uh, the left ear is, is back from that right ear. You can also notice a little bit of forehead bossing in that picture as well. So let's go on to the brachycephalic head shape, which again, same principles apply. We're going to take a, can, a scan or a cast of the child's head. And at this point, um, I'm taking more scans, obviously, than, than casts. And we're going to talk a little bit about the scanning procedure. And I brought the scanner here with me, so I'm going to show you guys what it does and what we come out with as far as the scan. But we're looking at building up the back portion of the head or that occipital region so that we get the growth to occur there, so the gap will be on the back of the head. We're going to contact the sides, which are typically wider, and we want to contain that growth and redirect the growth to the back of the head. Again, we want to uh, look at that cephalic ratio number when they come in, and then we want that cephalic ratio to be within the normal limits when they get done with the head shape or the, the head cranial orthosis. Then with the scaphocephalic head shape, again, we're looking at the growth and where we want it to occur. So on this child here, our red lines are at the top and then at the bottom of the head, 
and then we have our green arrows which are indicating where we want the growth on the side to occur. And then again a mold is obtained and the buildups are made on the sides of the head which allows us to get that uh, corrected head shape when they're in the helmet. And again all these head shapes will correct faster between that four and seven month age period and then kind of slow down a little bit as they get older. So the sooner the better as far as treatment both with positioning and with the helmet. So it's important to get going on that positioning and it's important to work on that torticollis as well. So here is, and you can't really see the top of that there, but after a two month trial of positioning, who should be referred? And, and that two month varies a little bit because um, IHC insurance does require three months of positioning therapy. And so you want to get them going as early as possible, okay? So this little chart here kind of lets us get an idea of when to then refer um, for a helmet or, you know, at least for an evaluation. Just kind of get an idea of where that child is at and where they have been and kind of follow them. So quadrant one on the mild, we see a little bit of ear shift and a little bit of change on the one side. Okay, we don't see a lot of change on the back. Um, opposite side. So we see a lot of change on that back right side but not a whole lot on that back left side. So we get into quadrant two we get a little bit more change on that back side with a little bit more flatness on that left side. And this goes right or left. Okay, On the example here it's that back left side that has the flatness in this picture. And we get a little bit more ear shift in that area. And then as we go to quadrant three and quadrant four we're looking at more ear involvement we're looking at certainly a lot more occipital or parietal prominence on the opposite side as well as increased forehead bossing on the same side as the flatness. A lot of times we'll see a lot more ear shift as well and as we get into the severe and sometimes the high moderate area we're looking at facial asymmetry as well. So the, the eyes and the jaw, sometimes the cheek will pop out and then significant ear shift on these children that, that get into quadrant three and four. And so really, at any point, whether one to four, you can refer to an orthotist as far as getting measurements and get a second opinion on whether or not the child's head is significant enough to warrant the use of a helmet or the need for the helmet. Usually between three and four is when we really kind of promote the use of the helmet as far as getting the correction because once they get into that range where they're significantly flat on the back, we're not going to get the change with positioning that we'd like to see. It's just not going to correct very much. Um, and the one thing with positioning is you can keep them on that side but the head's growing everywhere. Whereas with the helmet we're stopping the growth from occurring in one area and we're allowing that growth to occur in the areas we want. So the head is not growing everywhere at all the time, at all times. It's just in the areas where we want it. So um, this is a good little chart to refer back to when you're, when you're seeing patients. So look at that, three and four, it's, it's important to get them going on a helmet. One and two, um, send them for baseline measurements and, and follow them. And as they get into the two range, it's, it's more and more important to really work on getting that done. Contraindications, the helmet is not for everyone. And there are some things that we would look at as far as when they come in for an evaluation. Again, we're looking at ear shift and some different things to determine whether or not um, something else is going on with the head other than just an, an external force making some changes there. Sometimes children will come in and they just have really, really weird head shapes. You know, it's, it's pointing in the front, but it's really flat in the back, or, you know, there's some bumps in the back that just don't look right and a lot of times on those kids I will send them to a cranial facial doctor to you know for a further evaluation and they go in and, and they may do a you know a CT or an x-ray or something that would then rule out any cranial synostosis and, and the child just has some flatness in different areas that create a, a kind of an odd head shape. So uh, some contraindications cranial synostosis, cranial synostosis which is a premature fusion of a suture, you know, whether you know, in the front of the head, the back of the head, the metopic suture, 
any of those is going to create some offsetting and some different head shapes and so we don't want to do a helmet on those until that's corrected and that is only corrected through surgery the cranial synostosis so that would be with a cranial facial doctor to do that hydrocephalus and kind of here we have contraindicated until the volume is stabilized and a lot of times if the child has a shunt and you know we don't have that risk of the head you know increasing in volume or decreasing and changing with the shunt then we can and and I have done some helmets on kiddos that have had shunts and so it can be done we just want to make sure that that the shunt is in and it's functioning and we don't have that volume change in the head if they don't have a shunt and we're concerned about hydrocephalus a helmet is not indicated for that patient because of the volume change uh, children younger than three months of age and, and typically that's more towards the four month range I've done probably one or two helmets on kids that are about three and a half months of age and it depends really on the severity of the child some doctors will want them in right away uh, if not usually a four month start date is going to allow the child to have enough strength in the neck to handle the weight of the helmet and then it puts them in that range where they're growing quite fast and then children older than 18 months of age we're typically not going to put them in a helmet and that's just because there's very little growth that's going to occur after that you know things have pretty much all fused together even though again we're going to continue to get that circumferential growth until they reach their adult head size so younger than three months or, or younger than three and a half to four months not indicated and then above 18 months not indicated and a lot of times even after a year a lot of times we'll indicate that the head isn't going to change a whole lot and so we won't put helmets on too for too much after a year okay now what I want to do is let's talk about each one of the styles of helmets I'll just grab a drink of water here okay now each one of these helmets can be done on multiple head shape deformities so we're going to talk about them but just realize that we can use them on, on a, a brachy kid as well as a brachy kid or a plagial kid as well as a brachy kid or a scaphocephalic head shape first one we're going to talk about is the star band which is just the padded helmet that you see here um, it comes with about a half inch of padding and there's two different you know padding options as far as the, that goes but this helmet is indicated for a plagiocephalic kid or a brachy kid brachycephaly kid um, continued or can be used you know kind of post-operative if needed so uh, moderate to severe head shape deformity plagiocephaly and brachycephaly and then also um, that this kind of what I want to show you is this half inch allows some modifications to be done just by grinding out the padding versus you know any heating of the plastic that might occur to relieve any pressure areas okay so fairly easy to modify on this one um, I think we have a little bit more on the star band here it's an active you know the child's gonna grow and it's gonna redirect that growth to that flat area you know whether it's the left back or the right back or just centrally on the back of the head okay modified to full or partial asymmetry requires you know some skill and knowledge on it but because of the padding here there's um, going to be you know maybe some pressure but it's not quite as much because of the padding it is larger than some of the other styles that are used larger than you know the clear Serlin helmet and then uh, it does require some adjustment throughout the process if the child as they grow sometimes their head changes to where we have pressure areas later on in the treatment process and it can be adjusted for let's talk a little bit about the the starlight which is just the clear helmet um, again this is an active you know we're we're curbing the growth and going to one area of the head whether you know right or left or, or on the right or left forehead area as well okay um, typically a quarter inch serlin plastic again clear with a strap on the one side okay the strap on this helmet actually resembles more of this helmet now 
This is an old style strap, but we actually use a chafe and it folds back onto itself, which allows uh, to be a little bit tighter and it discourages the kids from getting the strap and pulling it. So again, modified to full or partial asymmetry. Allows parents the ability to look through the helmet and just visually see if there's any high pressure areas. And what they're going to look for is, you know, any areas that have white where the blood isn't getting to the helm or to the head. And a lot of times that'll just be caused by high pressure or, or that helmet's contacting that area a little too much, which can be adjusted with the helmet, you know, with some modifications. This helmet here, uh, what we do on this helmet is we can heat up the plastic and kind of pull it out in certain areas to create a little bit of a relief of that area. So we take that high pressure and we get rid of it. It allows them to keep wearing the helmet without needing a new helmet. Um, also used for deformational plagiocephaly or brachycephaly or asymmetrical brachycephaly. So um, very good helmet and, and a lot of helmets or a lot of kids will, or parents will use this helmet as a way to keep the size of the helmet down. So works well for that. All right, uh, the Starlight, I don't have an example of this one, but again, it's clear plastic, so you can look through it just like the Starlight one, or this, this one here, um, which is the Starlight, not the bivalve Starlight. Moderate to severe scaphocephaly, uh, brachycephaly is also indicated with this one. And it can be modified again to partial or, or full asymmetry in the child's head. Plastic can be heated. So obtaining the model, as we look at the child as they come in, there's the way of taking the traditional cast, which we can do, or we can also use a scanner. And so what I have today is actually the scanner. And so let's look at some of the good things about, about the scanner, okay? The entire setup of the scan process, you know, from, from kind of having the child come in to when they leave, is about 15 to 30 minutes and their information is, is put in prior to them coming in, so it kind of allows us a little bit quicker scan time. Very accurate head shape or model is obtained from the scan, and it's less stressful. The scan technology is safe for the children to use. In the end, what we can do allows for scan overlay, showing inf infant's growth in the flat areas. We can take a scan at the initial appointment, and then after they've worn the helmet for two months, we can take another scan, and we can lay those scans on top of each other, and we can see where that growth has occurred on the children. And then the, the report, or the scan report, can be, a scan report can be produced and can be sent to the therapist or can be given to the parents or sent to the doctor, which again is, uh, is good for the treatment process and, and involving the whole group of individuals that are involved with this child. All right, let's do this. I'm just going to click out of this real quick and I'm going to show you a scan and do one here for you to show you. Let's reset this scan. And let me just scan this head for you so you can get an idea of, of what it looks like and how it's done. So we have those little marks in the top there. And that I'm just going to bring down to the center of my screen. And then what I have here is a head with a nylon on it and some reflective dots. These dots give us an orientation on the head of where the head and gives us feedback into the scanner which then produces a model of the head or a picture of the head. So here's the scanner itself. Handheld allows me to get around and kind of use it on the child's head. So child comes in, we've met the requirements and the child has some flatness. We're going to have him come in and we're going to take a scan of the head. So what we're going to do is just we're going to get that and we're just going to scan the child's head and it kind of gives us an image of that individual head and customizes the helmet to each child as they come in. It is a little easier when I'm controlling the head. The child sometimes will be moving around quite a bit 
as we do this, but we're going to move all around the child's head and get a picture of the front of the face and just fill in, fill in all of our areas as we go here. A lot of times the kids just want to follow the red lights, which makes it hard to get a scan, but we'll use the parents to distract them. Or we have some toys that we kind of use that allows us to get a good image of the head. So once I've done that, and we've got a picture of the head, we'll go in, and we can just take this and click it, and it gives us this mold of the child's head. And it gives us, you can tell that there's a, the sock line in there, so it gives us a very accurate model of the child's head. If we look at this, you know, we can rotate it to the front or to the back. We can see the back of the head. We can see the right side of the head and the left over here on the left side. And then we can get an idea of where that flatness is occurring. From this image here that I have, we can get some measurements off this image and we can get a report of those measurements and we can print that out again to either send to the therapist or the parent or we can send it to the doctor. But this is a much cleaner and, and typically faster way than casting the child's head. And so that's kind of the scan technology that's out there and gives us a really good model of the head and it's really fast as long as the kid is really willing to work with us. Now let's get back into our PowerPoint here. If you have any questions on the scanner technology, um, go ahead and let me know. But let's go ahead and keep going here with our PowerPoint presentation. Fitting the helmet, the orthotist, when, they, when the helmet comes in, the patient comes in, gets put on the head, and then we mark our trim lines, and then we trim to those trim lines. Typically, the helmet comes back a little bit long which allows us to then trim exactly where we want it. If it comes back too short, then we have to rescan it and start again. Wearing instructions and break-in instructions are provided at that fitting appointment, and then a scheduled appointment at one week is scheduled so that we can come in, they can come in and we can make some modifications to the helmet before they go for a longer period of time. So it allows us to kind of keep track of them right after we fit it. The helmet usually is worn full time within that week period. Uh, modifications, again, as they grow, um, the helmets can be modified, both the plastic as well as the padded helmet. When they come in, look at red spots, modify those red spots. I want to kind of get to the insurances here before we run out of time. We can add padding to control rotation of the head, you know, the helmet on the head. Now. Let's talk about the insurances. Kind of a, an important part here. I'm just going to move that cord here. So, looking at who covers helmets, um, when the parent comes in, it's a good idea to kind of get them on, give them an idea of, of whether or not it's going to be covered. Traditional Medicaid, a lot of the Aetna plans will cover Select Health, um, Desert, uh, DMBA, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah. And then other plans may or may not cover, and other insurances may or may not cover, depending on the plan and the specifications. So um, the one important thing here on this screen is, is the insurances, and then also authorization will be attained by the treating facility. Okay. So Medicaid requirements, and we may not be able to go over these all in depth, but under a year of age and older, kind of between that four and a year, four months and a year, and then we want a cranial vault asymmetry of 0.6 centimeters or a diagonal difference, which is that DD, greater than 0.6, anything higher than that. It does require authorization, but you can do it on a brachycephalic child or pla plagiocephalic as long as they're meeting the requirements by Medicaid. Well, let's see, uh, Medicaid continued. We're looking at uh, the anterior fontanelle needs to be open, okay? The other thing is Medicaid, if they're younger than six months of age, they have to have done two months of positional therapy. And what we need is what they did for that treatment process. 
If they are older than six months of age, then no therapy is needed. And then we're looking at uh, cephalic ratio, two standard deviations above or below the norm. Okay. Etna, four to 12 months of age. And again, we're looking at diagonal difference greater than 0.6. Okay, so we're going to take our front left to right and our right to left and get that diagonal difference. Two-month trial of therapy and that it did not correct. So therapy is a common theme throughout all of these. Predetermination required prior to treatment. They do cover all three diagnoses. And then brachycephaly and scaphocephaly, two standard deviations above or below the norm. IHC, between 4 and 12 months of age, diagonal difference greater than 0.6 centimeters, three-month positioning therapy. So again, super important to get these kiddos working on some positional therapy. And that might be, you know, rotating the bed around or placing toys, tummy time, all those things that would allow them to get off that flat side of the head. Okay. Um, using a, a rolling up a towel or something, those kinds of, of options. They cover all three diagnoses, uh, brachycephaly and scaphocephaly, two standard deviations above or below the norm. DMBA, 0.6 centimeter on our diagonal difference. Student plan requires authorization, and um, a lot of the student plans are down you know, around BYU or something. Traditional DMBA plan does not require authorization, which is a good thing at this point. They cover all three diagnoses, and again, that standard deviation, two above or two below, so that you know they're outside that normal range. And, and on that little chart that we showed earlier, that's what we're looking at as far as cephalic ratio numbers, anything outside those numbers. Cigna, we gotta take pictures um, that then we fax in for that authorization between three and five months and has failed two month repositioning trial. Therapy, again. Six to 18 months of age. Um, Medicaid is six in a year, okay? Most of the insurances will do it up to 18 months, but we'll see less growth again after they get a year of age. Cephalic ratio, greater than or equal to, two standard deviations from the norm. Asymmetry of the diagonal di measurements, um, 1.2 centimeters. So instead of the 0.6, it's actually got to be higher than 0.6 centimeters. Um, other insurances may cover treatment, but it depends on the patient's plan and their specific requirements. Some high-tier plans of an insurance company may cover, while the low tiers don't. Sometimes we'll see a UHC that will cover on a higher tier plan, but not on the lower tier. And so really the treating facility needs to contact the insurance and specifically get their requirements and or whether or not the helmet is a covered benefit on that plan, that patient's plan. So, you know, ask any questions that you might have on the, um, the requirements there. If it's an insurance company that, that we don't typically see, what we do is we call them and just get an idea of whether or not they cover it or what the requirements may be if they do cover it. A lot of times, if it's not a covered benefit on the plan, then it becomes a self-pay helmet. And uh, the responsibility obviously then falls onto the helmet or the patient's parents or the family. And let's look at just some pictures here, some treatment outcomes that have occurred um, with treatment of helmet therapy. So um, the one on the left was pre-helmet, and then the one on the right is after treatment. So you can see that um, back right side on the child and then outside of treatment, that back right side has been corrected. Then we're looking at kind of a brachycephalic child on the next picture. We have a question, Dallin. Yes. Uh, Debbie asked, with the scanner results, can the computer do accurate measurements that you would typically do with your measuring tool? Uh, if you could clarify the difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical brachycephaly. Okay, a couple of questions in there. Um, the scanner, yes, we, when, after we've taken that scan, we'll put some dots on the child's head, on the, the picture on the computer, the scan there, and then it measures off of those dots that we put on there. And those dots that we put on there are in the same locations 
that we measure with our hands, with our caliper measurements. And so those measurements come out very accurate with both of them, but we can compare both the hand and the scanner measurements. Okay, but they're very close together. So uh, the other question was uh, the difference between brachycephaly versus asymmetrical and just regular brachycephaly. Brachycephaly is straight um, flatness on the posterior of the head. Okay, so straight midline flatness. Asymmetrical would be flatness on the occipital area as well as some parietal flatness. So when you measure the diagonal difference on just a regular brachycephaly kid, you'll, your diagonal measurements will be the same. On an asymmetrical brachycephaly, you'll have one diagonal measurement that is lower than the other, suggesting some flatness on the parietal area as well as midline flatness. I hope that clarifies that question there. So one is just on the back, and the other one incorporates some plagiocephaly head shape deformity as well. And then you can see on this child here, again, the left picture is, has the flatness on that back left side. And then we look at the right side, and we see some correction of that posterior parietal area. Cranial vault asymmetry or height, cranial vault height on our next picture, is reduced on the right side, where it's a little bit higher on that left picture there. And then also we get a little bit more correction, a little bit more occipital correction on that child as well. Uh, Post-operative remodeling. A lot of times multiple helmets will be used after they do the surgery, surgery to correct the cranial synostosis. And so... Typically, it's kind of a year-long process after the surgery for those kids. And so it may require two to three helmets or even a fourth helmet. Improvement of posterior symmetry. And, and you can kind of see um, the significance of the left head. And then the right one does have a, a little bit of flatness still in the back. And a lot of times we'll see that if someone comes in with a diagonal difference of 1.5 centimeters, sometimes they'll still, they'll make it down to say 0.7 and then they kind of stop growing, but they still have that flatness there or they get down to 0.5. Uh, sometimes we'll see just a little bit of growth that, you know, we weren't able to correct and they were in the helmet five months and the helmet, um, you know, depending on their growth may not get perfect symmetry of the head but it gets it a lot closer than it was. And again, we'll see a little change in the improvement in the cephalic ratio. So this child here, you, know, you can see kind of the head shape has changed a bit on that right picture there. And then uh, onto the last slide there. Go ahead and, and shoot me some questions if you have any. If not, that is the end of the presentation. So. Um, on insurances, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, my information is there. As far as our phone numbers, you can't see that number on that American Fork. I apologize. But uh, that number is 801-763-4568. And you can call that number. But you can certainly get a hold of our Provo office. And I'll answer any questions. I know um, we're, we're far from, from this area here in Utah or Cache County. But feel free to call me if you have any questions regarding helmet therapy. Okay, thanks, Dallin. Uh, we appreciate him taking the time to share this with us. I'd like to remind you to do the evaluation. The link is on the left side of the AggieCast page. Um, and please leave ideas if you have any for future trainings we can provide for you. Uh, also, the training will be archived after it's closed captioned. And also, DVDs will be made available. Uh, and I will make sure and send an email out uh, when the archived edition is available. Um, and you can also check out our previous trainings on our blog. And the address is utahatprogram at blogspot.com. And we'd like to thank you all for attending. And let us know if we can help you further in the future. 